All right, so hello and welcome back. So today we're going to be taking a look at Napoleon's defeat, uh, defeat, defeated, Aspen 1809 by Epic History TV last time we were in Spain. And now we will proceed um, because Austria-Hungary is mobilizing for war, so we're probably going to go rush Austria-Hungary. So without further ado, let's get to it. An Epic History TV History March collaboration. Supported by our sponsor, Osprey Publishing. In 1809, France, under Napoleon Bonaparte, was the most powerful nation in Europe. But the French Emperor's invasion of Spain and Portugal the previous year had failed to deliver the easy victory he'd expected. And with many of Napoleon's best troops and commanders now tied down in Spain, an old enemy prepared to challenge France once more. The court of Vienna is behaving very badly. It may have cause to repent. Napoleon to Joseph the 15th of January 1809. Austria had been preparing for war with France since her last humiliating defeat at Austerlitz in 1805. Now, with Napoleon busy in Spain and a British promise of cash subsidies, plus a supporting attack in Northern Europe, it looked like the ideal time to strike. This time, Austria's armies would be led by Archduke Charles, Emperor Francis's younger brother. At 37, he was two years younger than Napoleon, but already had 15 years' experience of high command. And he was learning from past defeats. He'd begun to reform the Austrian army along French lines, copying Napoleon's core system and introducing new infantry tactics. This is important to remember because in the Battle of Austerlitz, Austria got absolutely fucking destroyed. Also, British are going to send some money and be, maybe invade northern France because the BEF or whatever the fuck was in Spain was able to get out and get back to Britain. So there you go. In the Napoleonic Wars, infantry fought in close order packed together, standing shoulder to shoulder. But why present such an easy target for the enemy? First, command and control. Before radios, orders had to be relayed by shouted commands, drums or bugles. Difficult enough in the smoke and din of battle. Almost impossible if troops were scattered. And difficult enough to uh, memorize for just a regular rank and file to hear a drum and a uh, horn and know what is going on. Second, firepower. Smoothbore muskets were inaccurate beyond about 80 yards, so volley fire, firing en masse, was the best way to inflict physical and psychological damage on the enemy. And hitting 80 yards with a black powder musket is, is pretty fucking hard. I'll be honest, there's a lot of videos on that. Around 50 yards, you can, you can probably do it. Uh, but 80 yards pushing it. Third, morale. Soldiers were much more willing to advance into danger or hold the line if they did so together as a unit, urging each other on. That would not go away until World War I, later in World War I. Uh, the, and it makes sense if you're with your buddies, you probably don't want to run away and you have some morale support there. Fourth, defense against cavalry. Scattered infantry were easy targets for horsemen. Only by sticking together could they fight them off. The basic tactical unit of infantry was the battalion. A French line battalion had, in theory, 840 men, but in practice, nearer five to 600. And this is a little bit different from battalion sizes today, depending on what country you are from. Depends if you even have battalions, and if you have battalions, their strengths are all over the place. Usually, it's around 500, the US Army, 800, it can go up, it can go down, so which is a varying number. Our example here has 605 men, a typical strength for a battalion on campaign. The men were divided into six companies, four fusilier companies, and two flank companies. On the right, the grenadiers, made up of the tallest, strongest men, often detached to form elite all-grenadier units. And on the left, the Voltigeurs, specialist light infantry, 
used for skirmishing in front of the battalion. As what people usually don't realize is that, yes, there were actual units attached to a battalion. Again, not individual soldiers, because some people think that that's a thing you do in war for some fucking reason. But there is an actual unit. Again, they, are, they take cover, they sit behind stuff, they can shoot pretty good, and they're to skirmish in front of the line, and then the line is to make contact. And as he said, there's usually a grenadier company attached to each battalion, and then sometimes those companies could be um, detached to form their own grenadier battalions if they needed to break through a certain area or line that could possibly be used. Skirmishers moved independently, used cover, and fired at will to harass and unsettle the enemy, while preventing enemy skirmishers carrying out the same task. Most armies also had specialist light infantry units for this role, such as the British 95th Rifles, French Chasseurs à Pied, and Austrian and Prussian Jäger battalions. The traditional battlefield formation was the line. All companies formed up alongside each other, three ranks deep. Line formation maximized the number of men who could fire their muskets at the enemy, and limited casualties from artillery fire. But it was extremely vulnerable to cavalry if it could be outflanked. Which is why you technically have a tactical reserve behind them to stop this, or you have your own cavalry to stop this. And again, a line is actually very easy to direct. Again, you, when you don't have radios, um, seeing putting people in a line is probably the best idea um, to actually have you know command and control of them. Because if they're in a line, well, you know where they are. And even for well-drilled troops, it was difficult to keep the line straight while advancing across broken ground. So for maneuver and attack, battalions usually formed a column of divisions. This was a more flexible formation that allowed the battalion to advance quickly, though it presented a larger target to enemy guns, firing solid round shot that would tear through several ranks, and far fewer men could fire their muskets at the enemy. Theoretically, therefore, the battalion would deploy into line before reaching the enemy. But carrying out this slow maneuver under fire wasn't always possible or sensible. All these little pips out here that are on the back lines, these are your officers and high-ranking NCOs. So they go down. It's not the end of the formation, but it very much hurts the ability to command and control these guys. So some commanders kept their men in column relying on momentum to break the enemy line. This was a risky tactic that often worked against raw troops, but led to high casualties when facing better trained infantry, like British redcoats. A column could be closed up quickly to provide protection from cavalry, or if there was time, could form a square. With bayonets fixed, the battalion formed an all-round defence that often resembled more of a rectangle. Enemy cavalry could surround the battalion, but not break in, as horses won't charge a solid wall of men and steel. Almost every single horse wouldn't, unless you train your horse specifically for... <laughs> We're talking from birth to do this, and maybe it will do it, and maybe it will do it, but, you know, thousands of horses, not, no. And again, they move all of the important officers and NCOs into the center. And then again, you have probably have the battalion regimental flag and then the battalion commander and everyone else in the center. Um, basically, all you're trying to do is keep your command and control. Because, I mean, when you put your guys in this formation, you don't exactly need to tell them to really do anything besides you know, shoot and don't move. But an infantry square was extremely vulnerable to artillery fire and could only move very slowly. Changing quickly and smoothly from one formation to another, especially under fire, required training, practice and experience. In 1809, the Austrian army began to use the battalion mass formation, crude but more suited to hastily trained conscripts. Which is what they will probably use at the Battle of Aspen, is what I'm assuming. Also, 1,333 men for a battalion is really big for a battalion. This was a dense column with limited firepower and huge vulnerability to enemy cannon. But it could quickly close up to repel cavalry using the same principle as the square, but without the complex drill. And 
it's kind of the same. I guess you'd have to move these guys in the center of here. Because it's, it's kind of effective, I guess. It was much more maneuverable. Napoleon, warned by his spies that Austria was preparing for war, left Spain and raced back to Paris, arriving on the 24th of January 1809. The French army in Germany, commanded by Marshal Berthier, would need urgent reinforcement. So Napoleon summoned units from Spain, called up young conscripts, and soldiers from his German allies in the Confederation of the Rhine. So Marshal Berthier is going to be rank one of Napoleon's marshals, and he's going to be his chief of staff, which basically means Napoleon I did all the tactical stuff. He did everything logistic-wise and order-wise for Napoleon. Without Berthier, Napoleon doesn't do half the shit he does. Without Napoleon, Berthier doesn't do half the shit he does. They're, they're two of a kind, and they're both needed. Berthier was not with him at Waterloo, which led to a lot of confusion. Also, the Austrians, again, have uh, at least advanced. They have now advanced with the core system from, you know, four years ago when they got their ass beat. So instead of one massive army, they now have the core system. Again, every our European army will basically adopt the core system. Um, which is, it's just straight better than what they had before. And Napoleon was basically pioneering this. La Grande Armée was no longer the finely honed instrument of 1805. But with Napoleon at its head, it was still a formidable force. Archduke Charles ordered diversionary attacks in Poland and northern Italy but launched his main attack against France's ally, Bavaria, on the 10th of April. It came a week earlier than Napoleon had expected and caught the French Emperor by surprise. Charles was relying on a rapid advance, but a last-minute change of plans, torrential rain and a slow-moving baggage train slowed progress to a crawl. Let me my baggage train. You'll see a woman here, a woman here, and you'll see a farmer dude with a mule, okay? So, and another person. So, depending on the time period, depends on whether you bring your wives and your children and all of those people with you um, as camp followers, basically, in the baggage train. Baggage train is, is a term used generally for your supply line, more or less. But again, in the 1800s, we were starting to get away from bringing a fight basically being bringing your family to war we're starting to get away from that um it could still happen i'm not saying it doesn't but it's starting to go away but that's what a baggage train is it's basically all your supply marshal berthier was a brilliant chief of staff to napoleon but an indecisive field commander his forces were too widely dispersed and marshal davout's third corps was dangerously isolated at regensburg because if all these cores push, they can take this core out, this core out, defeat in detail. Again, that's basically, Napoleon does this all the time. If you can defeat these cores before they can be reinforced by anybody, it's called defeat in detail. Take them both out, and then you can just deal with whatever's here. And they have enough to do. Charles ordered his core to converge and destroy it. But on the 17th of April, Napoleon arrived at Donauwert to take over command. He immediately ordered Davout to withdraw from his exposed position. It was too late for him to escape without a fight. Davout's third corps was one of the best in the Grande Armée, and in a fast-moving battle across wooded hills, the heroes of Auerstadt threw back the Austrians. Despite the heroism of General Major Liechtenstein, badly wounded, leading his troops forward. Third corps escaped the encirclement. The battle. Yeah, under Marshal Davout, Third Corps is going to be very important. They're one of the, basically the best professional troops, some of the best guys he has, and probably the best in this entire uh, theater he's in right now. The Battle of Teugenhausen was the start of Napoleon's so called four day campaign. First, he used Marshal Lefebvre's Bavarian Seventh Corps and a provisional corps under Marshal Lann to drive a wedge into the Austrian army. Then he pursued its left wing towards Landshut believing he was following the main Austrian army. French troops and their German allies stormed the town's bridge to win a hard-fought victory. But Napoleon realized that Archduke Charles was not at Landshut, and that, once again, he'd left Marshal Davout to face the main enemy force. 
Sending Marshal Bessieres in pursuit of the Austrian left wing, Napoleon swung north, falling on the Austrian 4th Corps at Ekmu. You may wonder why you detach a cavalry regiment or cavalry reserve like this. Basically, all you're doing, because these guys are going to reform eventually, all you're really doing is pushing them away, and cavalry move faster than infantry. And all these guys are probably disorganized, which means you can harass them, get their supply lines, take a few prisoners, that sort of stuff, until they form up. Again, when they form up, this isn't going to work, but for now it works because they've been beaten and they're running away. And he's going to move north. And again, my, <laughs> uh, Davu with Third Corps fighting the whole Austrian army. I'm seeing a theme here. The French and their German allies won their fourth victory in as many days. But Charles's main force was still intact, and hoping to keep it so, he ordered a rapid retreat across the Danube. The French pursued, storming the walled city of Regensburg, which they knew as Ratisbon, with its vital stone bridge. Napoleon put Marshal Lann in charge of the assault. My boy Marshal Lann. When the attack faltered, Lann threatened to lead the next charge in person, and his men, suitably chastised, took the city. During the siege, Napoleon was hit in the foot by a spent bullet, causing widespread alarm, but it proved to be a superficial wound. Stubborn Austrian resistance had allowed Archduke Charles and his army to escape across the Danube. Napoleon had cut the Austrian army in half, but both sections now retreated in good order towards Vienna. Napoleon led his forces in pursuit, detaching Lefebvre's Bavarian Corps to deal with a popular revolt in Tyrol, and Third Corps and the Württemberg Eighth Corps to guard his line of communications. Charles... And you may say, why is that important? It's very important. His line of communication is basically goes to France. If anything is happening, because again, this is kind of the monarchist dictatorship kind of thing, um, there's always been trouble in Paris, put it that way. Um, and it never goes away from Napoleon. It actually just gets worse from here on. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that, again, when he starts losing badly, they start trying to overthrow him. So, this is probably going to be starting to be a theme here. The communication line lets him understand what's going on. If there's any, like if it's the British land somewhere, he can, you know, uh, be able to know about that and maybe shift some forces over there. And he's putting the Wittenberg and the Third Corps to do this. So it's very important to him chose not to defend the capital, which surrendered on the 13th of May after a short bombardment. Instead, Charles and the Austrian army lay in wait across the Danube. Hmm, I wonder why he chose not to defend Vienna. Because usually you defend your capital because, well, it's your capital and um, it's usually your highest population center. The United States is a little differently. DC, DC could be fallen. It, really doesn't matter because it's a it's a district um it's kind of like acre An anchor anchor um for turkey where constantinople is really important you know, the capital city is kind of important but it's not like a major population center uh but i mean charles is with the army so it is his call he is the monarch so if he doesn't want to defend vienna then he doesn't have to napoleon was now down to eighty thousand men facing 110,000 austrians Charles's army had fought bravely and well throughout the campaign. But Napoleon still had a low opinion of Austrian troops and decided to attack. Two cannons, all men are equal. Napoleon Bonaparte. So let, let's take a preference here. He's captured Vienna. He has 80,000 men versus 110,000 Austrians. The Austrians have chosen to not defend Vienna. They are in a defensive position, and they have more men. This is not a good combo if you want to attack. Usually you want three to three to one odds to attack, so you need three times the number to attack a position nowadays. Now, it can be swayed. There is a lot of play there. But usually you don't want to attack with a smaller force. Um, Napoleon said, if they, he says he thinks they're still weak troops. Now we're about to find out. On the night of the 20th of May, French engineers hastily built a series of floating bridges between the river islands of the Danube, and French troops began to cross. 
you do not want to be an engineer in Napoleon's army. God is awful. So this is <laughs> this is uh you have to get in the water to build a bridge. Fun fact. Um, so if and this looks like it's around winter time because this started this started around January twenty fourth. So again, don't really know the exact date, but yeah, they have to get in the water and build a bridge. It's not going to be a fun time. By noon the next day, Napoleon had most of Massena's 4th Corps and his cavalry across the river. About 24,000 men and 40 guns, holding the villages of Aspern and Essling. Now, again, I would also move my cavalry forward first. And one of the reasons you would do this, again, he bring infantry and cannons also. So infantry can hold the towns very well, okay? But this is a massive plain here, okay? This is ideal for cavalry units because cavalry are one mobile, go twice as fast or even more than infantry, and they can be used as scouts to basically set a perimeter out here. So, for example, if we send some of these cavalry units out here to any of these villages, they can act as an early picket. So, if the Austrians are like advancing, he the cavalrymen will be able to one hold the position for a little bit and buy time, and also let Napoleon know that they are in fact coming that way, so he can shift his forces over there. And they can also um, attack any stragglers or anybody that's moving out here to uh, the cavalry. Napoleon expected the Austrians to retreat once more, and that he'd only face a rear guard. But reports soon arrived that the entire Austrian army was advancing against him in five attack columns, 90,000 men and 300 cannon. Now you may ask why they're doing this. Well, it's very simple. They are on the defensive position. Now, they could have just, again, fought some defensive battle, but this is the ideal time to hit Napoleon. His troops are not all assembled. He only has one core and a reserve unit over here, and the rest are still coming. He can attack with 90,000 troops, as he said, and against a small, against a smaller unit of Napoleons, and he, he could drive them basically into the river, um, and they don't have a lot of space to maneuver or do anything. If he can bring his cannons up, he can force him back over the river, more or less. The situation got even worse. The Austrians began to float heavy barges and obstacles downriver to smash through the flimsy French bridge. Each time, Napoleon's only supply route was cut off for several hours, causing critical delays to the arrival of reinforcements and ammunition. barges looks like <laughs> kind of really do the battle began around 2 45 p.m as infantry of the austrian first column attacked aspern the village was soon under attack from three sides general molitor's french garrison clung on desperately fighting hand to hand in the streets and suffering 50 percent casualties to support the defenders of Aspern, Napoleon ordered cavalry to charge the Austrian third column. But they could not break through the Austrian infantry, closed up in their battalion mass formation. At six. Now you may ask why he's done this. Basically, it's to stop third column from hitting fourth corps on the side and give them time to basically try and hold these guys off. Um, but basically, again, this is going to become very apparent in the Napoleonic Wars, cavalry against infantry does usually not work anymore. Um, if they, again, if the cavalry is going against straight infantry and they have time to form up, it's not probably going to work. It can work, but it's probably not going to work. An infantry attack supported with cavalry, that still works. It's very viable. At 6 p.m., Archduke Charles ordered General Bellegarde's second column to take Aspern at any cost. Charles himself rode among the front ranks, urging the men forward. In ferocious fighting, the Austrians took the village. Napoleon immediately sent in newly arrived reinforcements to recapture it. About the same time, the Austrian fourth column began its attack on the village of Essling, where Marshal Lann had taken charge of defences while he waited for his own corps to cross the Danube. The first Austrian assault was repulsed. The veteran French cavalry commander, General Despagne, 
led his cuirassiers in pursuit, but was hit by grape shot and died of his wounds. Yeah, you usually get hit by grape shot, that's it, you're usually just dead. Around 9 pm, the Austrian 5th Column finally arrived in position and made its first attack against Essling, which was thrown back by Land's troops. As night fell, firing died out across the battlefield, and men got what rest they could among the dead and the wounded. Overnight, 2nd Corps and the Imperial Guard crossed the Danube to reinforce Napoleon's army. This kind of makes me wonder. Now, it is tradition to, tradition to stop fighting at night, especially in these camps. You can't see shit. Um, so you really can't you know, do anything. But this really does heavily favor Napoleon, because if he can get the rest of his guys across, by dawn, he's got all of his units in a small area that he can push back. Not saying that Charles made the wrong mistake here, or did something wrong here. Uh, it's just an observation, because it is night, you can't see shit, and no night vision or anything. Which now numbered 71,000 and 150 guns. But then the bridge broke again, leaving Davout's third corps still waiting to cross. Nevertheless, Napoleon decided to attack, and Davout Davu was the communications the supply line, uh, keeping that up, so his corps didn't get there until now, basically. Using 2nd Corps to break the Austrian centre. But first, Aspern would have to be retaken. Heavy fighting broke out in the village before dawn. By 7am, it was back in French hands. At Essling, fresh Austrian attacks were fought off by General Lasalle's cavalry, and units of the Young Guard. Ooh, the Young Guard. I, hmm, I don't know if we'll talk about it here, but basically Napoleon had different guards. Young Guard, Middle Guard, Old Guard. So, Old Guard, the third guys, never used really. The reason was because they were technically the best of the best, and Napoleon didn't like using them at all. So they had the, mysterious, the prestigious rank of not having to do... They always had a rank above everyone else in the army, and they also were older, and they also grumbled a lot to Napoleon because they could, because that was one of the privileges they had. Now, the unit's presence was very good. The unit's actual combat ability is still very good, but it's not legendary, let's put it that way. Now, the middle and the young guard, especially the young guard in the Battle of France that will come later, Napoleon uses the young guard and the middle guard um, to... <laughs> basically as tactical reserves and fire brigades. So basically throw them in wherever they're needed. So they get a lot of action, a lot of action. Some of these young guard guys have more combat experience than some of the old guard guys. Um, now this guard system does have a detriment. So if you take all of the line units, everyone wants to become a member of the guard because it's more prestigious. You get more money, more prestige, less duties. Okay. The problem is when you start doing that, one unit is fine, okay? Old guard has experienced officers and experienced men. That's fine. But when you start making the middle and the young guard, you start running into problems because now you're D, all the officers and the men here are losing guys to the young guard and the middle guard um, and the old guard. So they're not having their experienced officers retained or their experienced NCOs retained because they're just moving up, which leads to weaker line units, which is a, which is a problem. With both flanks secure, Napoleon launched his main attack in the centre, with Land's second corps. Austrian guns poured fire into the advancing French ranks. General Saint-Hilaire, leading the attack, a hero of Austerlitz and Jena, had his foot blown off, a wound that proved fatal. Archduke Charles sent his grenadier reserve forward to strengthen the line. The French infantry, under torrential fire, began to fall back. At this critical moment, the French bridge over the Danube was broken again, halting the vital flow of reinforcements and ammunition to Napoleon's army. By 2pm, the French had been driven out of Aspern once more. 
Heavy fighting continued in Essling, which was briefly captured by the Austrians, then retaken by the Young Guard. And you have to think that this battlefield is not very big. This is a pretty tiny battlefield compared to his previous battles. Like at Austerlitz, this is, this is tiny. This is a very small front for a lot of people. Napoleon knew his army could do no more. At 4 p.m., he ordered his exhausted cavalry to make a last charge to keep the enemy at bay, then gave the order to retreat. Now, one of the reasons you send the cavalry to do this instead of infantry is basically cavalry can run faster backwards. <laughs> um, if they need to bug out, they can run, you know, faster. As I mentioned uh, probably many times, um, cavalry can... Uh, Cavalry usually survive battles because they can run faster than infantry um, whenever they need to escape. So that's why you use cavalry as a screen force right here, and buy you some time, and then they can run away pretty fast. Archduke Charles, whose own army had suffered huge losses and was low on ammunition, was content to watch the French withdraw to the island of Lobau. In the final moments of the battle, Marshal Lannes, one of Napoleon's finest commanders and closest friends, was hit by a cannonball that smashed both his legs. My boy Marshal Lands, I think he dies here, and I'm very sad because he's one of Napoleon's pretty good. Not only is he Napoleon, one of Napoleon, I think he is his best friend. Um, he's also one of his best marshals, <laughs> um, and he's a very uh, upstanding guy. And as you saw earlier in this video, he he was about to lead a charge by himself as a marshal. He died of his wounds a week later. It was a deep blow to the emperor. What a loss for France and for me, Napoleon on the death of Marshal Lands. This is going to also become a theme. Napoleon is going to start losing not only just his marshals, some of his best marshals, and also some of his friends and some of his best friends. And this is going to take a toll on the man. By 1815, it's going to take a real toll on him, and you're going to start seeing some... Um, I mean, he's just tired of war at that point, honestly, in 1815. <laughs> The two-day Battle of aspern essling was Napoleon's first major defeat, caused by his overconfidence and hasty planning. Both sides suffered heavy losses, and Napoleon avoided a much greater disaster only because of the exhaustion of the Austrian army. That's true, because there's 7,000 French dead, 16,000 wounded, 6,000 Allied dead, 4,000 wounded. And the Allies are defending, technically, but they're also, they were actually attacking him. Um, so, I mean... That's not bad on the dead side for the Allies attacking him on a position that he was trying to cross. The French Emperor had learned new respect for the Austrians. Under Archduke Charles, they had fought bravely, with greater confidence, organisation and leadership. Within days of his defeat, Napoleon had summoned reinforcements to join him on the Danube, and begun planning his revenge. If you'd like to learn more about Napoleon's major battles or campaigns, our sponsor Osprey Publishing has nearly 200 titles on the Napoleonic Wars, written by specialist historians and covering everything from the history of elite units to tactics, weapons and uniforms. Visit their website to find out more. Thanks. So that's the end of the video. So, uh, yes, Napoleon did suffer a pretty bad defeat here. Um, not a major catastrophe because he was able to get his guys out and the Austrians didn't push because they were obviously exhausted. Um, but still, a defeat nonetheless. And one of the actual major issues here is that Marshal Lands is dead now. Um, and this is going to take a toll on Napoleon and also on the army as well. So hope you guys like that reaction. And uh, here's the playlist up here if you want to you know, watch and catch up on uh, the Napoleonic series if you haven't done that. Otherwise, I'll see you people later.